Well, we are in John chapter 7, verse 40. And I'm going to be gone the next couple days, but I've already recorded the messages. And so they'll be up on time, 8 a.m., log in and watch. And I know that this is a live broadcast, and so some of you could be listening to this a year after I've made it. But what's cool is God is outside of time. And I don't know how to explain it or necessarily, you know, apply it all the time, but I believe that God can retroactively answer prayer requests. Sometimes people put out prayer requests and I realize I didn't get the request until an hour after the surgery had started or finished for that matter. But the cool thing is that God is not inside of time. And if you pray a prayer of faith, even after an event has happened, assuming you don't know the outcome, right? I'm assuming you can't pray that the Seahawks win the Super Bowl after the Super Bowl's over and you just watch them lose. But the idea is, is uh, you can pray something and if you pray a prayer of faith, because you believe that, you know, God, I'm gonna pray and I know you could answer it and I want you to go back in time and fix the thing. Or I know that God answered that prayer a year ago because one year later I prayed. All that big like build up is a, a former student. When I was a student teacher, I had this guy by the name of Chad Borg and uh, Chad just asked for prayer. He's headed to fight a forest fire outside of Las Vegas. And uh, he says he's already got hurting and aching knees and it's on a big hill and he's got to climb up there. So let's lift up Chad and his safety and just pray that God blesses him. So Heavenly Father, we ask right now that whenever this fire takes place and whoever this Chad guy is that Pastor Joe knows, that you would have your hand upon him and that you would use him, Lord, to protect people, uh, to protect precious land and resources. And God, that you would just bless him as he seeks your face and your provision to protect him in the midst of the fire. In Jesus' name, amen. So, hope you prayed with me no matter what day and age you listen to this message. Now in verse 40, it's still finishing up the Feast of Tabernacles. Jesus had just cried out, offering up the living water. And since I've pre-recorded, we're going to go up to chapter 8 and no further. So, Let's, uh, hopefully I've got 10 minutes in all of this. Therefore, many of the, from the crowd, verse 40, when they heard this saying, said, truly, this is the prophet. Others said, this is the Christ. So again, a reminder, Deuteronomy 18, 18, back in chapter 18 uh, of Deuteronomy, where Moses is told that another prophet would be raised up like him. And Christ, again, is the Greek for Messiah. So, the Jewish Messiah, and it means anointed one. Ever since the Garden of Eden, the Jews knew an anointed one, a savior would be sent by God to redeem their people. And so some think it might be the prophet, others the Christ, turns out they're both right. But some said, will the Christ come out of Galilee? Has not the scripture said that the Christ comes from the seed of David and from the town of Bethlehem where David was? So there was the vision among the people because of him. Now some wanted to take him, but no one laid hands on him. And so obviously you know, and I know that Jesus was born in a manger. Well, he was laid in a manger, born in a stable or born in some kind of a rest place, rest stop, truck, a truck stop in Bethlehem. But they didn't know that. They knew him as Jesus of Nazareth, not Jesus the babe of Bethlehem. And for what it's worth, I at least commend them for knowing their scriptures and knowing that the Messiah was supposed to come from Bethlehem, but they're getting divided over this stuff. And I guess something I just heard Keith Green say the other day, obviously an old recording of his, but he says, I love the scriptures where it contradicts our understanding of God. Nothing contradicts within the scriptures. The, con the scriptures will never contradict themselves, but they might contradict the way we see God. They may contradict my understanding of God. They may contradict the teachings of our church. And he says, I love that because he goes, what that does is it challenges me 
to have a bigger understanding of who God is. That God doesn't always fit in our little box. And the Bible speaks of, and great theologians have always agreed, there is a, a, a matter of mystery to God that we'll never fully understand Him. And although I feel like almost every question I've ever struggled with, God has given me an answer over time, I still realize that when I come up to stuff I don't understand, I, I don't need to worry and I don't need to, to oh, you know, freak out because all of a sudden here's some scripture that's challenging my beliefs. And what that does is it keeps us in tension. It keeps us always looking, always seeking, always searching. It makes it so we can't just say this is how God works because oftentimes he, he does do different things. He works in different ways. He works in mysterious ways. And so they had an issue because Jesus wasn't fitting in their box. They thought, again, they had an assumption he was from Nazareth, but they were wrong, that the scriptures were correct, that the Christ would be born in Bethlehem. And so they wanted to lay hands on him, but no one would. It is not, his hour had not yet come. And so verse 45, it says, Then the officers came to the chief priests and Pharisees who said to them, Why have you not brought him in? The officers answered, No man has ever spoke like this man. Then the Pharisees answered them, Are you also deceived? Have any of the rulers or Pharisees believed in him? But this crowd, uh, this crowd that does not know the law is accursed. And so what's happening is now there's the Pharisees, the Sanhedrin. Sanhedrin was a group of 70 leaders, and they were like the court system, the religious court system. And there was the Pharisees, which I want to say there was 6,000 Pharisees in Jesus's time. I mean, it wasn't a huge group, but they were very significant and powerful religious leaders. And what they're wondering is, well, why haven't the officers, i.e. the guards, they had palace guards, you know, and temple guards, I guess. Why hadn't they brought Jesus in? Well, the guards were mesmerized. No one's ever spoken like this before. At the end of the Sermon of the Mount, uh, when the crowds had gathered, they account how they said he, he spoke with authority, unlike the scribes and Pharisees. Jesus spoke of his own authority, which is going to be a big part of chapter 8 over the next three days. We'll be doing chapter 8 or over the next, yes, three days we'll be doing chapter 8. And so, yeah, it's, it was something they were confused about. So the guards wouldn't take him in. And so the leaders then are saying, well, it's because these crowds, they're uneducated. They don't know the scriptures. You know, heaven forbid one of the Pharisees should begin to believe in him. And so that's kind of what's going on. But then verse 50, Nicodemus, who came to Jesus by night, being one of them, being one of the Pharisees, one of the Sanhedrin, he said to them, Does our law judge a man before it hears him and knows what he is doing? They answered and said to him, Are you also from Galilee? Search and look, for no prophet has arisen out of Galilee. And everyone went to his own house. So, Nicodemus, interesting character. We spent a good amount of time when we started John chapter 3 talking about Nicodemus Ben-Gurion, some of his history, where he went after the Bible stories in moving in with Gamaliel. Great stuff. Go back and listen to John 3, the very beginning, verses 1 through 3, I think. Um, but, but, yeah, you could see how he was kind of being undercover at this point. He was, he was hanging with the Pharisees, hanging with the Sanhedrin, and he was trying to get his input in. I desperately desire, hope, and believe that Gamaliel was one to Christ. Uh, history says that Nicodemus died a poor man, and he moved in and was living with Gamaliel. And I believe Nicodemus was saved, and I have a good hunch that Gamaliel wouldn't have brought him in if Gamaliel didn't become a follower of Christ also. And we see in the book of Acts, Gamaliel, um, he's the one when he says, ah, just don't worry about these guys. You know, we've seen other false prophets come and go. And so if it's a false prophet, it'll just die off. And if it's not a false prophet, if it's real, we wouldn't want to fight against God. And so it's really similar what we hear of Gamaliel in Acts with Nicodemus right here. And maybe some of us ask, well, what's the big deal with this Gamaliel guy? Nicodemus was a teacher of the law, but Gamaliel was one of the most famous rabbis of all time. 
I mean, outside of the Bible characters we're all familiar with, and Gamaliel, I guess, is also a Bible character, but to the Jews, he was one of the greatest teachers of all time. Um, much of the law was even fit into specific categories, and I want to say it was his grandfather, uh, Hillel, who a lot of this was all based off of. And when Gamaliel died, I'm probably not going to get it word for word, but it was said when Gamaliel died that the beauty of the Torah died with him. So he was a significant, significant person uh, in the eyes of the Jews, and I truly hope that we will get to meet Gamaliel in heaven along with every other human being that's ever lived. We all know that won't happen, but I always wish, obviously, that everyone would go to heaven because no matter how evil someone is on this earth, hell will be more than a just punishment. And so, hoping to see Gamaliel in heaven, definitely going to see Nicodemus in heaven, and I hope that all of us will see each other one day in glory, in his presence, rejoicing to finally be done with the sins and struggles, the tear and the suffering of this world, and we get to rejoice and be in his presence forevermore. I'll see you guys tomorrow morning, 8 a.m. Share this out and invite a friend. God bless you guys.